On July 16th, our guest Jeremy Hamburg gave a very interesting presentation to our general meeting of Ascend, and we'd like to follow up with uh, equivalent presentation here. So Jeremy, over to you. It was an honor to talk with so many people from Ascend uh, on the 16th of July. We had almost 60 people come, and what we found was that people wanted to continue the conversation about how to apply the five steps to their life. And so I'm really happy that you invited me back because we would love to talk more about um, how do you apply the five steps in a way that helps you make friends and maybe even start finding love uh, in a way that's meaningful to you. So that's what we talked about uh, a few weeks ago, and I'm so excited to continue the conversation with you. And so, you know, the first thing that we talked about uh, when we did the, the, the big presentation was that it's really important to know who you want in your life. And so that's why, you know, I always say that one of the first steps to having the social life that you want and the friendships that you want and, and even the relationship that you want is to picture your storybook ending, right? Because that's just a fancy way of saying that uh, it's important to know what you want your life to look like. And I actually read an article yesterday that, that made me think about this, this step. Um, I was reading an article where the author, uh, he wrote something that I found to be very poetic. He, he said, a vision without a plan for achieving it is a fantasy, right? A vision of what you want your life to look like without a plan or a strategy for achieving it is just, it's a fantasy. And that's so true, but it also got me thinking about the opposite. What is a plan without a vision? What is a strategy without a vision? Because that's what Alana and I see you know, almost every day in the autism community. People are trying to learn social skills. They're going to social skills classes. They're taking social skills courses online. Um, you know, their parents maybe are trying to teach them social skills. But the issue that we're seeing is a lot of people don't have that vision of what they want to accomplish with those social skills. And that's a problem. I think that's a problem first because learning something without having an end goal in mind makes it kind of unfulfilling to learn it, right? You're not learning, it doesn't feel like you're learning with a purpose. And so it's, it's really hard to motivate, um, but it's also really hard to learn specific social skills without having a goal in mind because how do you decide what skills to focus on? And so, you know, when Alana and I talk about picturing your storybook ending, what we're really trying to help people do is just know what the end goal is, right? Know what your purpose is, because that's what allows us to, you know, reverse engineer the plan for making it reality. Could you clarify um, a little bit about that? Also, do you mean a storybook ending for your overall life? or a storybook ending for a particular encounter person? That is a really good question. Um, and so, first of all, I think that the answer is both, right? I think that you need to have a vision for overall what you want your life to look like, because there's sort of a famous quote from the Cheshire Cat uh, in Alice in Wonderland, which is, you know, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And I think what that means to me is that, um, you know, if you don't have an idea of what the end goal is, what your purpose is, what you want your life to look like, you're just kind of aimless, right? They're having that purpose though, um, having that vision of what the end goal looks like it, it is a really important motivator um, for planning, strategizing, and then going out there and, and mastering the skills. But as you said, you know, having a, a vision of how you want a specific encounter to go is also really important, right? Because those specific encounters are ultimately what allow you to build up towards that entire vision of your life. So let me give you an example. I'm new to California. 
right? I moved here in the middle of the pandemic uh, in 2020. Yeah, so I'm, I'm now 3,000 miles from home because I'm from New York in a new state with no friends in the middle of the pandemic, right? And so um, as the world started to open up, I needed to uh, start making friends so that I didn't feel as lonely as I was feeling. And being that I have uh, small kids, one of the ways that I do that is by trying to meet people at um, birthday parties, right? Because my kids are like, they go to birthday parties like every weekend. And so for me, picturing my storybook ending was a vision that ultimately I won friends who will go hiking with me. Uh, or I want friends, and I want friends who will teach me how to surf. Um, and I want friends who will like watch the New York Rangers hockey team with me because I'm still a New York Rangers season ticket holder. So for me, like when I close my eyes and I think about what do I want life to look like, I want a bunch of guys who are going to come over and like eat some chicken wings and some pizza with me, you know, while I while we watch the the New York Rangers playoff games. Um, and, you know, after we're done with that, I'd like to, you know, go on a, you know, two or three mile hike uh, somewhere in my neighborhood. Um, and, uh, you know, when the weekend comes and I don't have the kids, like, I think it'd be really cool to have a friend who will like, you know, just come pick me up in their, you know, in their SUV, put my, my new surfboard into the back of their car and we go together to, I don't know, Doheny Beach or, or something like that. Right. So that's the ultimate vision of what I wanted my life to be like. And so I have a very clear vision of that. But then the question is, and Keith, you really pointed this out well, how do I get there? And so one of the things I do is I use these birthday parties. So, you know, I will, I will, before a birthday party, I will imagine myself wearing the clothes that I'm going to be wearing. And I'm going to close my eyes and imagine, you know, what does the room look like? Um, what does the room sound like? There's probably going to be pizza there. So like, what does it smell like? Because I want to be prepared for the entire sensory experience. And then, you know, let's say it's a, I know that it's going to be a, a pool party. So I imagine like all these parents in their bathing suits. And then I imagine myself walking up to like one of the dads who's maybe wearing like an Anaheim Ducks bathing suit being like, you know, oh, hey, you're, are you a Ducks fan? And I'll, I'll imagine the conversation. He'll be like, yeah, I'm a Ducks fan. And I'll be like, oh, cool. I love hockey. I'm a, you know, I'm a Ranger season ticket holder. And I try to imagine that conversation. And then I imagine myself saying, hey, you know, really good talking to you. Um, can we get together for, for coffee on, you know, on Monday afternoon? And I really want to sort of like feel what it's like to ask this dad to hang out with me and go out for coffee because, uh, because if I can imagine that feeling when I'm, you know, if, if I can feel it when I'm imagining it, then it's not going to be a new feeling when I actually do it, right? I'm going to know that it's coming. And then I just want to imagine the dad saying yes. I want to visualize the dad saying yes and how it feels to be triumphant. And, and so, you know, Keith, you asked, is visualizing, you know, the life that you want, is it about a specific instance or is it about your whole life and it's about both right because once you make those specific instances what you want them to be it builds towards that ultimate vision of what you want life to look like one of the things that i think might be a very uh, important factor and uh you know it's a pushback on this and i discussed this uh with my wife i'm the only extrovert in my family so i've got introverts and i got downright really shy people there. So Jeremy, you seem to be a very friendly and outgoing person. I am. You, yes, yes. That's why I like you. <laughs> um, what would you say to people who they understand what to do, but they can imagine it would be, it, it's scary doing that. How do you deal with the anxiety or how do you deal with the fear so that you're able to do that? You know what to do, but it's still scary. How do you minimize the fear? That, that's also a great question. And the truth is, Keith, that fear is even there for extroverts, okay? So when, when any human being is thinking about walking up to another human being, there's fear involved. That fear might be a level one, it might be a level 10, but there's always that sense of fear involved because humans are wired to fear the unknown. The unknown is dangerous, uh, or at least our brains think so. 
And so, you know, the only way that we get to have the social life that we want is by overriding that, that brain's message to our body. Don't do this. Don't do this. There's danger involved. And what I found really helped me was sort of understanding the psychology of our fear, right? Our brains sort of evolved in this hunter-gatherer society where, you know, if we lived in a tribe of 20 people and we got socially rejected, everyone else heard about it and it reduced our status and which means that it pushed us to the, you know, to the, to the outskirts of society. And so our brains evolved to, to, to evaluate risks and not take ones that we deem to be uh, risks that are too big. And, but we're not in a hunter-gatherer society anymore, right? There are 300 million people in America. There's something like 8 billion people on the planet. If you try to talk with someone and they're just not interested in talking to you, nothing happens, right? Nothing bad happens. You don't get pushed to the outskirts of society, right? No one is going to physically hurt you. And so our brain just hasn't caught up to, to what society is like right now. And I saw, and I oftentimes remind myself of that. I remind myself that fear is false evidence appearing real, right? Fear can be an acronym, false evidence appearing real. It's, it's this well-intentioned belief on the part of our brains that we need to protect ourselves, but the end result of our brain protecting ourselves is that we're isolated and it actually makes the situation worse. So, you know, my thing that I always do, like I used to love going to, to pools at the hotel. The hotel pools are always freezing, right? The only way to get into a freezing cold pool is to, is to one, two, three, jump. And so that's what I do. Uh, you know, I know what I'm going to, to say in a conversation because I have pictured it a hundred times in my mind, just like I described for you before. I know what it's going to be like to walk up to someone. I know what I'm going to say because I pictured my storybook ending. And to get over that fear, I just, it's like being at the edge of a swimming pool. I just jump in and I let my brain sort of work on autopilot. And it can work on autopilot okay. because I spend so much time preparing what I'm going to say and what I'm going to do that I can just see that video in my mind, that movie in my mind that I created of the interaction because I spent time uh, visualizing that interaction before it actually occurred. So what I hear you saying is one of the best ways of getting used to a situation, which may indeed be quite stressful, is sort of the Carnegie Hall approach. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 practice. practice. But the beautiful thing, Keith, is that we can practice in our minds. And that's the whole point of the first step. Practice doesn't mean that you actually need to approach a hundred different people to start a conversation with them. You can practice talking to a hundred different people in your mind, and that is just as valid and just as good as practicing in real life. So the second step is to find your tribe. And what I mean by that is it's so much easier to meet great people and have great conversations and build a spark in a connection when you are in a place where the other people there enjoy the same things that you enjoy. And so, you know, when we think about what a friend is or when we think about who a partner is, um, sometimes it could just feel like this magical concept, right? Like what's a friend? I don't know, it's just, it's just a feeling, right? Or what makes a, a great like girlfriend or boyfriend? I, I don't know, it's just kind of this feeling you get. And what I found is that science actually explains to us what a friendship is or, or what a relationship is. And so, you know, let's talk about friendship for a moment, right? There are three qualities that a person needs to have to really be a friend of yours. And, you know, the first one is that they need to allow you to be yourself. So many people on the spectrum are just so sick and tired of masking. They're sick and tired of, of, of just trying to fake who they are so that they can pass themselves off as neurotypical. Guess what? It doesn't work. 
I have a really good friend on the spectrum. His name is Stephen Rodriguez. And, and Stephen said something to my client community that will always stick with me. He said, I can fool them for like 10 minutes, but I can't fool them forever, right? And so all of this effort that people put into masking or, you know, or, or, or trying to present as neurotypical, it's kind of wasted. You're not gonna fool anybody. Um, and nor should you fool anybody because the people who belong in your life are the ones who really love the way that your brain works and really love who you are. They love, you know, they love the quirks and they love your, your, your character and they're cool with that. They want you in your life because of who you are, not in spite of who you are. And so that's, that's one really essential quality. Um, the second essential quality is that they are committed to building the relationship with you. And, you know, this is something that I didn't talk about uh, back in July with Ascend, but there's a, there was a study, uh, I think it came out of maybe the UK, and what it showed was really sad. Uh, it, it, pardon me if I get the numbers a little bit wrong, but it's basically said one out of every two people on the spectrum has zero friends. And that's sad in and of itself, but that's not what, that's not the part that I think is more important. I think the more important part is that of the 50% or so that say they have a friend, that friend, quote unquote, doesn't feel the same way. And so what that means is that a lot of people on the spectrum think that they have a friend, but they really don't that other person may not see you as a friend. And what that probably means is that they're not putting effort into getting together with you. They're not putting effort into getting to know you. And so what I'd like you to sort of take from this bullet point is that, you know, just knowing someone, that's not enough. That's an acquaintance. What you really want in your life is someone who will call you up or text you just as much as you call them up and text them and they'll ask to get together with you so that you're not always the one who asks to get together with them or they ask how you're doing you know how your day is going it's not just you asking them how their day is going a friendship shouldn't be one directional right it should be bi-directional you both should be splitting the effort to make your friendship and your relationship as great as it can be and then the last thing is you want to share a common interest. So a lot of my friends are hockey fans. They're even New York Ranger fans like I am. Well, you know, some of my friends are enjoy hiking as much as I do. Um, you know, I have a couple of friends who love surfing. And so they're teaching me how to surf um, because that's something that I enjoy. A lot of my friends are, I was, a, I was a high school debater. I was a huge debate nerd in high school. A lot of my friends are just still people that I used to debate with or debate against in high school because we have that common love for argumentation. And so that's what I want for you. You know, I want you to find people who love you for you, are committed to building the relationship and have some common interests with you. And so the way that you do that is just by spending your time where those kinds of people spend their time. Over the years, uh, you, I, and many of our viewers here have heard or seen that the internet and various kinds of social media are a great way of connecting with people and making friends and relationships. What are your thoughts about that? So, look, there are always going to be some people who figure out how to make the internet work for them. Okay. I never want to make a blanket, blanket statement that something is always bad or always good. It isn't, right? There are 9 billion people on the planet. Some people are going to be able to make the internet work for them and some people don't. But what I have found too often in the autism community is that people are substituting interacting on the internet for interacting in real life. And so, you know, it's not unusual for me to, you know, have a young adult call us, you know, for a strategy session and tell us, yeah, like I spend 12 hours a day playing Call of Duty, right? Or, you know, I, I spend like 13 hours a day, um, you know, on, on Discord. And 
while that might feel good in the moment, and maybe you even are, are chatting with other people on the platform, the problem ultimately is that you're not meeting these people in real life. They're not really your friends, right? When something really great happens in your life, these aren't people who you're going to celebrate with. You know, if something really unfortunate happens in your life, these aren't people who are going to be there to help you and to comfort you, right? They're just these distant electronic acquaintances. And, you know, I think that back in the day, you know, 15 years ago, I think there were a lot of people, including myself, who thought like, boy, oh boy, the internet is going to be a great place for people with autism to, to meet others. And, you know, we talked in the presentation back in July about, about why that was supposed to be, you know, they're like, 5 billion people on the internet, right? Some of them, statistically speaking, are going to be perfect for you. Um, and, you know, when you're chatting on the internet, you don't need to think about making eye contact and you don't need to think about, you know, whether you're using your hands right or, you know, whether you're looking in the right place or, you know, whether, whether your posture is good. None of that matters on the internet. Um, and, you know, what I, what I personally like most about the internet is you have time to think about the question that you're answering and you have time to formulate an answer and then edit your answer before you, before you write it. And so I think there were a lot of people, including myself, who thought that the internet would be really perfect for people on the spectrum because there are just so many billions of people out there and you didn't have to think about all the social cues and body language that you would have to think about you know, if you were like at a bar. Um, but the reality has just been pretty devastating. And, you know, sort of what we found is that um, the internet really makes it twice as hard uh, for people on the spectrum to meet people. And the reason why is because if you're gonna try to meet people on the internet, the first thing you need to do is, ma is master the internet. And so you need to be really good at like chatting with them. And if you're doing online dating, you have to have a really good profile and you have to be really good at, you know, figuring out who to message and who not to message and what to say to them and what not to say to them. And like, how many times do I, do I message them? Am I messaging them too often? You know, one of the things that we hear way too frequently in the autism community is people getting in trouble for harassment because they send too many messages. That's a hidden rule. And it's not something that is evident to a lot of people on the spectrum. So they get into trouble, sometimes legal trouble. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the problem with trying to meet people on the internet is that you have to master all these hidden rules. You have to figure out all these hidden social cues that, that exist on the internet. And once you do, once you figure all of that out, the only thing that gets you is like one hangout or one phone call or one date, right? So after you've spent years and years and years like messaging all these people and trying to find the right ones and, and, and all of that stuff, the only thing that gets you is like, like one coffee meeting or you know like one phone call and you really need to ace that phone call or you need to ace that coffee meeting or that date. And if you don't have the social skills to do it, that's the end, right? And then you just end up going back to the internet again and trying to do it all over again. And so, you know, what, what I tell people is, you know, work on your social skills, work on your in-person social skills. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about, about having a mental library in the next step, but know what you want to say to people, know what you want to ask, know how to, how to be the most confident version of yourself and just focus on being in the places where your tribe is gathering. That way you don't need to master that entire set of online social skills. You can really just focus on mastering your in-person social skills and using them on people who enjoy some of the things, same things that you do. I understand that uh, you and uh, your partner Alana developed what is called, or use the term, mental library. Could you uh, tell our viewers about that? Yeah. So. You know, in the last step, right, in step two, we talk about finding your tribe and being in the places where um, people share similar interests as you. But what we found is that for so many people, and it's not just autistic people, right, 
there are plenty of introverts in the world, plenty of shy people in the world um, who will go to events and they'll just stand on the periphery. Uh, and sometimes people call those folks wallflowers because they're just hanging out against the wall. Um, there's a term that I really like and it's called uh, alone within a crowd. So you're in a crowded area, you're with a crowd of people, but you're really alone. Everyone else is interacting, but you're not. And a big part of the reason for that is that you just don't know what to say, right? If you saw another person across the room, you just don't know what you're gonna say to that person. And so that creates a real fear of rejection, right? Like if you walked across the room because there was, you know, a girl on the other side of the room who, you know, who, who looked attractive to you, as you're walking across the room, your brain is going to be saying to yourself, oh God, oh God, what am I going to say? What's she going to do? This is going to be bad. And then you just don't do it. And so one of the things that my clients have found to be really helpful is building a mental library. And what that means is sort of have an outline of the stories that you wanna tell, the questions that you wanna ask, uh, and even the answers that you wanna give. Because the fact of the matter is that most conversations start with the same group of questions, right? How are you? Where are you from? Where did you go to school? What do you do for a living? And so if you are prepared for the answers to those questions and you're prepared to give answers that are really interesting, it's going to help your conversations be smoother and more seamless and then the more that you do it, the more you're going to have confidence that you can build a, a spark with someone else. And, you know, one thing that I really love about conversations is that they actually follow a pattern, um, which I think actually makes it very helpful to teach conversation skills in the autism community. Because what I have found is that people on the spectrum tend to be way better at patterns than, than I am. Um, and so when you think about a conversation, it's really kind of just four elements. So, you know, if you were to go up to someone at a party or go up to them at a convention and you were to have a conversation with them, chances are that conversation is just some sort of mixture of four elements. Questions, right? They're going to ask you questions. You're going to ask, ask them questions. Um, answers, right? If you ask them questions, they're going to give you answers. If they ask you questions, you're going to give them answers. Um, people tend to tell stories when they have conversations. Uh, and, you know, if you want the conversation to amount to something, if you want it to result in something, you need to talk about what comes next, right? Whether that's, oh, it's, you know, let's exchange numbers or, you know, let's, let's find time to, you know, grab coffee or go for lunch or let's meet up, you know, tomorrow, uh, you know, at, at this other booth in the convention. Whatever it may be, you know, a conversation is questions, answers, stories, and next steps. And so you can plan for those because that's what really socially successful people plan for. And, you know, going back to what we were talking about in the first step, picturing your storybook ending, you know, I told you that when I go to a birthday party or before I go to a birthday party, I think about what the experience is going to be like. I think about what's it going to sound like? What's it going to smell like? What am I going to do? What am I going to say? And so that's part of my mental library. Uh, if I go to a kid's birthday party, I have questions prepared for you know what I want to ask another dad or another mom. Um, I have stories about my kids that I can tell. Uh, and I know that they're going to ask me some of the same questions. They're going to ask me, oh, you know, it, who, what teacher does your does your daughter have? What teacher does your son have? How are they liking school? Right? I have answers prepared to all of those things. And not only that, I have recited the answer in my head and visualized it in my head dozens and dozens of dozens of times. So that when someone actually asks me the question in real life, all I really need to do is replay the video in my head that I've replayed a hundred times already with myself answering it. And that's what a mental library is all about. So I've heard uh, you discuss uh, that we on the spectrum have an autism superpower. Uh, what could you tell our viewers about that? Yeah, so what I have found over the years is that when we have struggled a lot and we focus on that struggle, it's really hard to live the best possible life. Um, and I really honor the fact that so many people on the spectrum have been rejected over and over and over and over again. 
And many people on the spectrum have been bullied and they've been told by their peers that they're going to amount to nothing. They've been told by their teachers that they're a failure. And what happens is that after a while, you really start to internalize that. You really start to believe that you're a failure and that you're not worthy of having the life that you want to live. And then what ends up happening is once you start internalizing those thoughts, you actually go out and you look for evidence that it's true. And so every time something negative happens in your day or happens in your life, you are just adding to the evidence that you are less, that you are broken, that you're not enough. And those thoughts eventually morph into beliefs, right? A, a belief is nothing more than a thought that you have internalized. And too many people on the spectrum have internalized the belief that they are broken, that they need to be cured, that they are not capable of the life that they want to live. And so, but the truth is that there are plenty of people on the spectrum who are living the life that they want to live. And I have just been blessed that I've probably gotten to interview close to a thousand people on the spectrum, whether through free strategy sessions or through my work at adaptations or workshops that I've led for organizations all around the country. I've gotten to meet probably close to a thousand people on the spectrum. And I really love understanding what makes the successful people successful. And I really love understanding why the people who are struggling are struggling. So talk, just talking for a moment about the people who are socially successful, what I found is that they really know what their strengths are and they use those strengths to their advantage and they focus on those strengths. And so, you know, one thing I like to tell people is that um, a trait is actually neutral. A personality character is neutral. Um, even a behavior is neutral. Even something like stimming is actually neither good nor bad. A trait, a characteristic, a quirk, it's what you make of it, right? It's how you talk about it with others. It's whether you use it as an opportunity to connect or an opportunity to withdraw. And so I always remind people that like there are aspects of, of having autism that are like really special. People on the spectrum tend to be really honest. And now, can that be negative? Yeah, like black and white thinking, being really blunt can, can absolutely turn people off. It can absolutely like make people angry with you if you are, um, you know, if you're not used to, or if they are not used to dealing with someone who is, who is just blunt and honest. Um, but, if you use your bluntness and your honesty the right way and you frame it in, in a certain way, it is absolutely a superpower because, you know, in, in this world where so many people have just been, they've been cheated, they've been lied to, um, you know, they've been deceived. Imagine how refreshing it is, how beautiful it is to meet someone who will just be honest with you and be straight with you. And so I think back to the comedian Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer, I, I'm pretty sure is neurotypical, but her husband is on the spectrum. And what she says she loves about him is that, you know, in a world in which people just don't tell you what they're really thinking, she says her husband does. <laughs> if she asks, how do I look in this dress? He doesn't lie to her. He doesn't give her a, a fluffy answer. He, say, he said something like, you look great or you look terrible. You know, I don't like it. And there's, there's something beautiful in that honesty. And, and, and there are like countless other traits that uh, while they're not unique to autism, you find, um, you find oftentimes in people who, who are on the spectrum. And so whether that's integrity or loyalty, right? Or creativity, you know, or, or tenacity, right? People with autism have overcome so much to be where they are today, right? How many of you overcame challenges at school, you know, to get your degree, right? How many of you, uh, goodness knows what you've overcome. And so there's just a level of tenacity to you that may not exist in other people because they didn't have 
the challenges and the struggles that you had. So find what those superpowers are, focus on those superpowers, not on what the challenges are, and turn those superpowers to your advantage. One of the things uh, your program stresses, uh, Jeremy, is the importance of mentorship. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I, I, I say it in every presentation. I wish that I knew when I was younger that having a mentor is the fastest way to success. I think that there are so many people in this world, uh, including my younger self, who just wanted to do things myself. I wanted to, I, I thought that there were points given in life for accomplishing something myself. And, um, and the truth is like, that's not how the world works. You know, it's not like a math class where you get points for showing your work, even if you get the wrong answer. From my perspective, if you want to have friends, either you do or you don't, right? Either you have them or you don't. If you wanna get married, either you get married or you don't get married, right? There's not a whole lot of points that you get along the way There's for, for trying and failing. And so, you know, for me, as I matured, I realized if I want, if I want to accomplish something, I should just work with someone who's accomplished it too and someone who can teach it to me. And so, you know, for example, like I wanted to have a coaching business. I've been coaching for 13 years. For the first nine of them, I tried to figure out my own way and I struggled. Um, but then somewhere around year nine, when I, you know, when I was like, I don't know, 35 years old and more mature, I realized, you know what? There are people who coach coaches. I can hire a mentor who will teach me how to be the best coach I can be and run the best business I can run. And so I did that. Um, and I'll be honest, like it was pretty expensive, but the end result is that I got farther in three years than I did in the previous nine. And truthfully, I got farther in the first year working with a mentor than I did in the previous nine because my mentor taught me the strategy that I need. My mentor uh, motivated me when I was getting unmotivated. Uh, my mentor held me accountable when I started slacking off. But most importantly, when I had big important questions, I would just ask my mentor and my mentor would know the answer and I would just do what my mentor told me. And so, you know, what I see really often in the autism community is people are like, well, I really wanna have friends or I really wanna start dating. So I'm gonna watch a whole bunch of YouTube videos and then I'm gonna read a bunch of like, you know, books on dating. And then like, I'm gonna take like, you know, a $10 course. And what ends up happening is they just have this mishmash of like ideas about like, okay, how do I build friends? Or this mishmash of ideas of like, how do I start dating? And I call it a Franken plan because it's, oh, you know, I'll take a bit from this video and a bit from that video and a bit from this book and a bit from, you know, that website. And I'm just gonna mash it all together and like, poof, like suddenly I have a, a, a a plan for how to be socially successful. And the truth is like, that doesn't work, right? You know, what, what ends up happening is that people on the spectrum just get overwhelmed by how contradictory the advice is out there, right? One, one video says, walk up to someone. And one video says, wait for them to walk up to you. And one video says, stare them in the eye. And another video says, you don't have to, you don't have to make eye contact. And by the time you're done watching all these videos and reading all these books, you're like, what the hell do I do? And so the right mentor is gonna be a person who has coached lots of people on the spectrum, whose strategy works for lots of people on the spectrum, who knows how to motivate lots of people on the spectrum. And you can look at, at their strategy and you can look at their results and say, you know what? That's probably gonna work for me. And when I embark on this journey with this mentor, I know that I'm going to hit problems along the way. I know that there's going to be challenges. And rather than spend another 10 years of my life trying to figure out how to solve the problem myself, I'm just going to call up my mentor who's seen the problem a hundred times, knows exactly what to do. He'll tell me exactly what's going wrong. He'll tell me exactly what needs to go right. And I'm, then I'm just going to do it. I'm going to get back on the path to fulfilling my purpose and having those friends and having those relationships. So, you know, long story short, Keith, there are no points for trying and failing. 
at the end of our life, we're either going to look back on our life and we're going to say, I had the friends I wanted or I didn't. I had the spouse I wanted or I didn't. And we're not going to, that's what matters. Know what you want in life and just work with someone who knows how to help you get it. So you can get there quickly and with less agitation and less frustration so that you can spend the next 50 years of your life enjoying yourself. Very good, Jeremy. Uh, I was going to lead in with a line uh, that was saying, and I wonder where you could find such a mentor <laughs> and you could reach out to them. Because <laughs> the truth is, I'm not, the truth is mentors are different for different things, right? Like someone asked me at Ascend, where do I find a mentor? And, I'm, and, and the truth is, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for a job, you're going to want to have a, a job mentor. If you're looking for, for to have a more social life, you're going to want to have a, a social mentor, right? Anyone who says that they're good at everything yeah. is probably good at nothing. And that's the truth. And so, you know, Alan and I are really, really good at mentoring people into friendships and into relationships, but we don't even try to mentor people into, you know, into jobs, right? Mm -hmm. Or into independent living situations. That's just, that's not our skill set. Very, very sensible. Be good at what you're, uh, a narrow thing. It's like a lot of, it's what I hear is some of the finest restaurants are like, typically you would see them in Japan. And I don't know from experience, but I've heard it's like these are very, very few items, but they are such good items. They don't try to be all things to all people. And he, let let me let me stack on that, Keith, because there's something to what you said. So if you were to go to Japan, you will see that there are restaurants that that specialize in sushi. Um, and there are restaurants that specialize in a specific type of sushi and not another type of sushi. There are restaurants that specialize in udon noodles. There are restaurants that specialize in ramen noodles. There are restaurants that specialize in tempura. Mm -hmm. And they don't try to specialize in everything. But what's more important and something that you really see in Japan is that an expert becomes an expert because he or she trained with another expert. Yeah. And that's especially true in the sushi world, right? If you ever talk to a sushi master and you ask them, how did you become a sushi master? They'll say, I worked under so-and-so. And if you're gonna, and, and if you ask that person, how did you become a, a, a sushi master? They'll say, well, I worked under so-and-so, yeah. right? Exactly. And so every coach has a coach. And, you know, my coach in, in the, for my mindset, I have five coaches. I have a mindset coach. My mindset coach uh, trained with Tony Robbins. But you know what? As famous as Tony Robbins is, Tony Robbins was trained by someone else. And that person trained with someone else, right? Going back to the beginning of time, all of us who, who are good at something, all of us who succeed at something are successful because we had the help of a mentor who had their own mentor. That's how wisdom is generated. And that's why we shouldn't try to do things on our own. It's really hard to generate wisdom. It takes a lifetime to generate wisdom. It's much easier to just find someone who already has the wisdom and have them teach you. Jeremy, this has all been very, very valuable uh, to our viewers and to myself. If uh, our viewers wanted to learn more about the five steps, what's the best way of uh, reaching out to you? Yeah, thanks for asking. So, you know, one of the things that Alana and I pride, us, pride ourselves on is that we give some of our time and our expertise to any autism family that, that wants to be more social. And so, you know, if you're on the spectrum, we will uh, spend 90 minutes with you and your parents talking about what you want your life to be like um, and, you know, where you're getting stuck in the social process and, and, and how to um, get to where you want to be and live the life that you want. Um, and so if you're on the spectrum, uh, the, uh, the web address is mybestsociallife.com forward slash free session. And what that's going to do is it's going to take you to our calendar. And we just ask that you uh, sit down with your parents for a moment and figure out what time uh, works best for the three of you so that we can spend 90 minutes together uh, strategizing. And if you're an autism parent and you're watching this, 
uh, you can go to mybestsociallife.com forward slash apply, and you'll do the same thing. You'll sit down with your co-parent or, or spouse or significant other, and you're going to find a time that works for, for the three of you, uh, and we'll get together, and, and we'll just talk about how to help your son or daughter get to the social life that they want to lead. Now, you know, some people ask, like, is there a catch? Like, no, there isn't. Um, but we really like talking to people who, uh, who are passionate about making friends or starting to date and who are prepared to put in the effort. Because when all is said and done, if, if you don't really want the outcome, if it's not something that, that is really meaningful to you, you're not going to do the work. Um, and so, you know, at the end of our strategy session, maybe working together is the right option for all of us. Maybe it isn't. Um, we'd be happy to try to connect you with a better resource. But the end result is we want to spend 90 minutes just helping you get clarity um, on, you know, what you want your life to look like and, and, and how to get there. Uh, and I say that uh, it, knowing that I got an email this morning from a mom. Uh, we did a strategy session, uh, the mom, the dad and, and her 25 year old son about a month ago. And I just got this email this morning out of the blue. Um, where, which said, um, thank you for the strategy session. It really inspired my son. Uh, he's, he's been talking to more people and the conversations have been going better. Uh, and uh, he, the mom said, my cousins um, told me after our family gathering that they realized a change in, uh, in my son. Uh, and in fact, my son went into the, uh, into the college cafeteria uh, over intercession and started talking to people and landed a girlfriend from it. And so, you know, really, really great things can happen in your life when you have clarity about what you want and what's going wrong and what you need to do to fix it. And so that's what we'll do together during our strategy session. So that's, those are the web addresses to, to put some time on our calendar. And you can always email me at jeremy at mybestsocialic.com because we love hearing from people. So again, Jeremy, this has been invaluable. Everyone, our guest has been Jeremy Hamburg of mysociallife.com. Until next time, I'm Keith Halperin, wishing you a very fine life, social and otherwise.